Hello, welcome to the first video on Crime Time. My name is Sneak Snag, and you may know me as the variety streamer on Twitch, um, but what you might not know about me is I have a criminology degree. What I thought would be really cool is making a true crime channel and kind of discussing specific things or specific cases, maybe some stuff that's not as educated that I think should be within the criminal justice system. I don't really know. I thought we would start with something uh, a lot of people heard about, and that is the case on Lori Vallow. Before we get into this, um, I do want to say that it, this isn't just me. My amazing editor and Ethernet cable is doing a lot of this fancy dancy stuff that you're probably going to see that I don't even have involvement in. Um, and my wife, Hannah does actually a really good job and loves to do research. So she actually pulled in a lot of these uh, interesting details and little things that neither of us really saw a lot of bigger news things talking about. So uh, we'll get into those. I just wanted to make sure people are aware that it's not just me. Um, I hope you guys like it. And obviously, because this is a new channel, I would love if you subscribe. Let's get into it. So if you don't know, Lori Vallow for a couple months just didn't report her children missing and they miraculously ended up buried in her husband's lawn. There's a lot to unpack here. What I thought is it would be cool, and I don't see a lot of people doing, is kind of going through the bits and pieces of Lori and kind of how we got here. And not only talking about her, talking about the, the people involved and talking about the trial itself and the results of said trial. Lori Vallow. So she was born and grew up in Southern California. Um, she was part of the Latter-day Saints. And if you don't know what that is, it's a pretty extreme religious group. The Latter-day Saints is seen as restorationist, non-Trinitarian Christian denomination belonging to Mormonism. Restorationists believe that Christianity should be restored to the teachings about the early church. Um, and a non-Trinitarian is somebody who rejects the Holy Trinity, you know, like the mainstream belief that God was like three pieces. Um, this is a pretty intense group that's kind of got real passionate extreme beliefs in terms of their religion and how that should be directed. Um, so it, it, to this note, it does say here that she wasn't apparently very extreme, but it's still the Latter-day Saints. It's a little bit much. So that's important to understand that she grew up religiously. She grew up in a very intense religious uh, community. She married her high school sweetheart, Nelson Yanes, in 1992. Uh, they married right out of high school. They are alive. <laughs> which might not make sense now, but you'll see where we go. Three years later, moved to Texas to be with a person named William Lagoya. Hope I say that right. And they had a, a baby, Colby Jordan Ryan, in 1996. And they divorced in 1998, quoted as she was in a bad situation. So in 2001, she married Joseph Joe Ryan and legally adopted Colby, who she had with her previous husband, marriage three, and then had Tylee Ryan in 2002 with Joseph Ryan. Divorced in 2004, claimed he was physically and sexually abusive to her and her children. And she's quoted as being so angry at him, she contemplated murder. Her older brother, Alex Cox, did taser and threaten to kill him in 2007. Uh, somehow three years after this happened. Interesting. And then in 2018, Joe died from a heart attack. Dead husband number one. It was investigated after all this recent stuff came up, but it was actually found that he did die of natural causes. A lot of the other stuff around this is kind of sketchy, but apparently this one kind of is just like, that's what happened. That's life. You know what I mean? In 2006, she married Charles Vallow. It's said here that there, there's a 17 year age gap, which is a lot. And they were married for seven years, which is the longest out of her marriages. Marriage four. And she moved to Kauai. I think I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Kauai. All right, cool. <laughs> she married Charles Vallow and she moved to Kauai, Hawaii in 2014. And she adopted Charles' biological grandnephew, Joshua Jackson, JJ Vallow. And JJ uh, was autistic. Her friends are actually quoted as saying that Lori was an extremely patient and ideal mother for him in that time period. They also had two children from his previous marriage and joined into this as well. So we have Tylee, we have Colby, we have JJ, and we have Charles Vallow's two other biological children. Fourth marriage, five kids. And then in 2017, Vallow moved to Arizona. This is apparently when she began reading Chad Daybell's Doomsday books and friends started to notice her behavioral changes and stuff like that began happening around the time, as well as the dynamic shifting with her children and her friends as well. So we're kind of seeing where stuff starts to sort of play out. Let's talk a bit about Chad really quick. 1990, he marries Tammy Daybell in Utah. They founded the Spring Creek Book Company, and that's where Chad published his books. In 2015, they moved to Salem, Idaho with their five kids. In his books, he claims to have had two near-death experiences sometime in his late teens, early 20s. Doesn't really explain what those were or what happened and when. He's 
extremely vague. He does say that that kind of gave him a spiritual connection. He talks a lot about Doomsday in his books, um, you know, stuff like the religious ending, like the Book of Revelations, stuff like that. He says he has like experiences and visions of the future and how the world is ending and how it's gonna end, stuff like that, right? He frequently attended a lot of uh, Doomsday Prepper conferences. Apparently was big on listening to like Prepper podcasts, stuff like that. So he really is in this mindset of like preaching doomsday, preparing for doomsday. Chad reportedly specifically taught in small groups, and this is important, we'll talk about it later. He talked about how people can become zombies and their spirits go dark. Not sure what that exactly means, but he would basically say, if not literally say, that these people needed to be killed so their zombies would be cast out. But he also taught that everybody has nine lives and that reincarnation was possible, all of which was also not accurate to what the Latter-day Saints teach. Bit of a mixed bag. Not really sure exactly what's going on anymore. But as you can see, Chad is a, is a very intense uh, apocalyptic writer. And Lori has these intense beliefs about herself and about her religion. And so this is kind of where the, the, the lines cross. This is sort of where the, the, the threads weave together, right? One of Lori Vallow's good friends, Melanie Gibb, is quoted as saying that Lori saw herself as having this patriarchal 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 power which was higher than the melchizedek power i'm sorry if i butcher that melchizedek is seen as a divine being in the text and is referred to as el or elohim titles usually reserved for god so apparently this is a high religious figure within this community she's kind of saying that these powers that she's referring to that she believes she had within the latter-day saints church melanie gibbs said that chad would groom her into believing this and encouraging this behavior the only real relationship that's disclosed of Melanie Gibb is that they were former best friends. I'm not sure when this friendship came to be, uh, but it seems like Melanie is similar or if not the, a part of the same kind of church belief of the Latter-day Saints. In, in 2018, a year after they moved, dated as October 28th, Lori meets Chad in person for the first time at a religious prepper conference in Utah. Melanie Gibb is at this conference as well. She is quoted to say that it was very flirty when Lori and Chad had met and started talking. This is where it starts to get weird, so buckle up. Apparently, Chad had mentioned within this flirty conversation that uh, him and Lori had been married in a previous life. And Lori told Melanie that she believed them. Uh, as the first digital evidence of Chad and Lori's friendship, Lori had a contact in her phone for Chad titled Bishop Shumway. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Um, so in 2018 of November, uh, there's another conference in Arizona. Melanie says that Chad stayed with Lori while Charles was out of town. They also stated that she believed this was a hookup, whether it happened prior or just now. It's kind of like Melanie's like, this definitely happened now. I mean, he's staying at the house when her husband's gone. The picture's a bit clear there. During that weekend, Melanie says that Lori told her that she and Chad were sealed together by Maroni and Jesus Christ in the Latter-day Saints temple and that the relationship of multiple lives was to be reunited. Like I said, it's a lot. <laughs> so December 25th of 2018, literally Christmas, Melanie Gibb and her family spend Christmas with Lori and Charles. Lori tells Melanie that she had a dream that Charles was in a car accident and that he would not be home January 1st, 2019. When the date passed and Charles didn't have the car accident, um, Melanie asked Lori about it and Lori replied, he didn't because Satan interfered with the plan. I mean, like each paragraph is another thing to unpack. So, we're, we're, you know, we're just getting started. But Melanie testifies during the trial. This is kind of, she started to distance herself from these extreme views um, from Lori. She's starting to realize that Chad and Lori are kind of encouraging each other in these like absolute extreme beliefs. She stated Lori confided in her about her conversations with Chad. She testified that Lori had told her, her and Chad believed their spouses were going to die. And then her and Chad could be together, which is totally not weird. She began describing her children to Melanie as zombies or dark the same way that Chad would describe these sorts of people to his small groups the way he would say people would become zombies and their spirits would go dark right so now Lori is adopting this same language on her children apparently she confided that JJ would climb up on the fridge go to the cabinets on top of them and just act more aggressive which is probably just a kid being a kid during the trial there's a phone call played um, where Melanie recorded it and she asks the couple about JJ and where he is been asking like 
please just answer. Lori responds super innocently. I could tell you everything where JJ is right now, and that would not be good for JJ. What does that mean? No idea. So January 2019, Charles texts Brandon Bordreau and says that Lori has accused him of infidelity. Um, Lori tells Melanie that Charles was taken over by an evil spirit and they needed to perform castings to get it out of him. Over the following months, Lori discusses this with Melanie, telling her that Charles had been taken over by a couple of spirits and that he needed to be cast out. Extremely vague on what that means. January 31st of the same year, uh, the police have body cam footage, which was put in the trial as well, of Charles telling the police that he is concerned about Lori, that he thinks that she's a resurrected being and a god. That is a direct quote. And in the footage, he's begging her to get assistance and that she should go to Community Bridges, which was apparently a mental health facility near that. Community Bridges did a medical eval in which she was deemed competent. Now, I just want to make this clear. At this time, after all this information, information we have she was deemed competent so i'm not sure if that's just the facility being incompetent or if she did a really good job of hiding such things but either way because this place did not deem her as incompetent they could not admit her you can only be admitted against your will if a facility deems you as incompetent so Lori did not go to that facility she refused february of 2019 charles files for a divorce saying that he's fearing for the safety of himself and the children. Lori's priorities had drastically shifted, believing that she no longer cared for him or the children and was heading into religious extremism. He also adds that she threatened to kill him and states that in a phone call on January 29th, she states that she was a god assigned to carry out the work of the 144,000 at Christ's second coming in July 2020 and that if Charles got in her way of her mission, she would murder him, end quote. Yeah. Uh, so the document continues in the divorce filing and says that later this the next day, Lori kept referring to Charles as Ned Schneider on the phone. When asked about it by Charles, she stated that Ned had killed him and taken his identity. A pretty bold claim to say to the person you're saying this happened to. So she then warned that she would kill him upon his return home. He was in Houston for a work trip and that she had an angel to help her dispose of the body. Um, she would continue that she could not trust Charles and that not only would she kill him, but she would destroy him financially. And after this conversation, the two rarely spoke and Charles filed for the divorce. So yeah, it's a lot. So February to March of 2019, Charles contacts Kay Woodcock, requesting help because Lori left and Kay would often help take care of JJ while Lori was gone. Uh, Kay states that in February, Charles approached her about having her named as the sole beneficiary of his million dollar life insurance policy and removed Lori from the policy. Charles and JJ eventually moved to Houston as it was closer to Kay in Louisiana. Um, according to Kay, Lori left her husband and child for a total of 58 days during this period. Lori never reached out to JJ or Charles during this time. It was later discovered that Lori was in Hawaii. Per Kay and Larry Woodcock, Charles's sister and brother-in-law, Charles would speak to them constantly about his concerns for Lori and fearing that they would not be able to overcome these new beliefs and would be unable to save their marriage. Larry is quoted saying that some nights he'd call me just crying like a baby. March 2019. A joint bank account between Lori and Alex Cox is used to purchase a round trip flight for Chad Daybell from Idaho Falls to Mesa. During this time, Chad Daybell Googled June 26 star sign, which is Lori's birthday, and are Cancer and Leo compatible? I think we're a bit beyond that point, bud. April 2019, Lori moves back with Charles and JJ. They go to Texas and Charles stops the divorce filing and states to his family that he just wants to make his marriage work. Very noble of him. May 2019, Chad and Lori both search Malachite and eBay Malachite jewelry. Both of them do this, and it is found out later uh, that Lori and Chad's wedding bands are made of Malachite. Also important to note, Charles is still alive and married to Lori at this point. Definitely not used as evidence during the trial, just saying. It was 100% used as evidence. That was sarcastic. If you think your phone or your computer has zero tracking capabilities, you are wrong. They thrive off information. June 2019, Charles and Lori move to Chandler, Arizona. Lori explains to Melanie at this time that Ty Lee, her other child, is dark and has been from like February of 2019. Also important to note that Melanie Pulaski and Lori's niece, Brandon Bordreau, divorce. And Brandon claims that Melanie has affiliated herself with similar beliefs to Lori and has joined the cult. Uh, 
Melanie told Brandon she received visions from God telling her she was not safe at the home with him. Um, July 1st of 2019, Charles has been confronting Lori regarding her affair with Chad. I'm assuming they haven't been extremely subtle about it. He contacts Chad and confronts him regarding this and asks why he has been sent and requesting Lori's dance videos. No explanation. What the fuck does that mean? What is the dance videos? Does she just send people dance videos? Are they explicit dance videos? Are they just like, does she, is she hitting the renegade? Is this like a TikTok dance, the video? Why does Chad want them so bad? Why does Charles know about them? I don't know. That's all it says. And while he's accusing Chad of this stuff, he texts Lori multiple times and states that you've accused me of infidelity, but it's you. You have been having the affair. It's killing me, but maybe that's your goal. The fact that you will continue to go to the temple after all you've done shocks me. There really is something wrong with you. You have to be exposed for what you are. He texts Lori saying that he's going to go to Idaho and talk to Tammy Daybell regarding the affair between their spouses. On July 9th, he Googles when you surprise someone with accusations. Uh, July 11th of 2019, Charles Vallow is shot and killed by Alex Cox, who is Lori's brother, in the Vallow home in Chandler, Arizona, after Charles arrives to take JJ to school. Alex apparently is spending the night at the house, and when Melanie Gibb asked Lori why he was there that night, Cox claimed that Lori and Charles got into a fight and that he was protecting his sister. And when he shot Charles, it was in self-defense, stating that Charles attempted to attack him with a baseball bat. The police interview shows Lori smiling as she recounts what happened. Both Lori and Ty Lee, who were at the home at the time of the shooting, state that Cox acted in self-defense. Also important to note here that Charles was shot, nobody performed CPR on him, and they also waited 40 minutes to call the police. Somehow, this is not in consideration by the police. Life goes on somehow. September of 2019, so Lori moves JJ and Ty Lee, her two uh, remaining younger children, and her brother Alex to Idaho, where Chad lives. Convenient. Not sure why Alex is moving around with his sister. Uh, the dynamic isn't really explained surrounding Lori and Alex. We'll kind of get into why shortly. September 8th, Lori, Alex, JJ, and Ty Lee go to Yellowstone. This is the last time Ty Lee was documented as being seen. So September 9th goes around. Alex's cell phone data places him in Chad's yard for two hours. Chad texts Tammy that he shot a raccoon and buried the animal on the property. Sick alibi, dude. I'm sure it won't bite you in the ass. It's quoted, text to wife, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. September 22nd was the last day that JJ was seen alive. He was in school. He was seen by Lori's friend, Melanie Gibb, and David Warwick. Um, they were staying with her that weekend. They both stated that Alex was carrying JJ into the apartment. September 23rd comes around. Lori's two friends, Melanie and David, asked to see JJ because they had seen him carried into the house previously the day before. And Lori is quoted saying that he had to be taken away because he was being a zombie. Alex's cell phone places him in Chad's yard again for about 17 minutes. Lori calls JJ's school and unenrolls him, stating that he won't be back and she will be homeschooling him. October 2nd, Brandon Bordreau, the ex-husband of Lori's niece, Melanie, is shot at in a drive-by shooting in Arizona but was not hurt. The shooter was driving Charles's car. Somehow, nothing came of this, even though somebody shot at him driving a dead man's car. Brandon was a close family friend to Lori and apparently baptized Ty Lee at the Latter-day Saints Church. Melanie. Began attending meetings with Lori in the fall of 2018. They were religious in nature, but not sponsored by the church. Apparently made it clear to Brandon that he was not welcome at the meetings and that they were her thing. She became increasingly focused on the idea of the world ending soon. Brandon later said that Melanie was not very religious when they first married, but she became really passionate about the church and these ideas. Uh, December 25th of 2018, Brandon states that the last Christmas that his family spent with Charles and Lori, everything felt different. He said that Melanie Gibb and her family were present. October 9th, Tammy Daybell, Chad's current wife, calls 911 after being shot at with a paintball gun in her driveway. A very similar occurrence to what happened to Brandon. 10 days later, October 19th, Tammy dies in her sleep at 49 years old. The death is ruled to be from natural causes, and the Daybell children said that they declined an autopsy given that the coroner told them that she died from natural causes. They stated that prior to her death, she had been in poor health. Not weird at all. November 5th, Lori and Chad get married on a beach in Hawaii. No one has seen their children since September. Both of my children are gone for two months. I'm going to get married in Hawaii. 
naturally. This is also where those Malachite rings come in, in handy. Later, in November, JJ's grandmother, Kay Woodcock, contacts the police, asks them to check on JJ because she hadn't heard from him or been able to contact him since August. And when she spoke to him on a phone call, it was like less than a minute. She states that she attempted several times over the following months to contact JJ, but never got a response from Lori. This is where the investigation begins because somebody finally reported something. Just to keep in mind, nobody, Lori, not Chad, not anybody involved in Lori's family reported anything about JJ or Tylee being gone for three months. All the while, Lori and Chad are in Hawaii. Yeah. November 26, Idaho police of Rexburg arrive at Lori's house looking for JJ, and they find Lori and Chad present, who stated JJ was not there, but safe and staying with Melanie Gibb in Arizona. When Melanie was contacted about the whereabouts of JJ, she was not very informative about the situation, but later contacted the police, basically saying that he had not been with her at all. When the police returned the next day to Chad Daybell's house, they had a search warrant ready, the couple was gone, and later found to have gone to Hawaii again. Uh, the police soon realize that Ty Lee has also not been seen in months. This is now a nationwide search for these two children, all while both of them are in Hawaii. December 11th, Lori Vallow's brother Alex Cox dies at 51, deemed by natural causes. The autopsy revealed a blood clot in his lungs as well as Narcan in his system. And if you don't know, Narcan just doesn't appear. Also, Narcan is used to treat drug overdoses. And say somebody were to inject Narcan into somebody who didn't need a, a fix from a drug overdose, bad things happen. So Alex mysteriously dies right after the police begin a nationwide search for Lori's two children. Somehow his death is considered a natural cause. I don't understand. I don't know who these coroners are. I don't know what the fuck Idaho is doing. Insane. December 12th, one day later, Tammy's body becomes exhumed because everybody's like, this is getting weird. Tammy's actual cause of death was asphyxia. If you don't know what asphyxia is, it's kind of this grab all that basically says this person died because they could not receive oxygen. It's not really like somebody made them not breathe. Something caused them to not breathe. It's just like in general, their airway closed. They died of lack of oxygen. That's it. That's what asphyxia is. Not exactly clear, but also not a natural cause of death. Usually people don't really just have an airway closed because they get old. It's usually something else. Leading Tammy's death, Alex Cox, Lori's brother once again, searched bullet drop data using an AR-15 in cold weather and shooting a victim inside a vehicle. He searched this. The detective believed that Cox was trying to gauge where to stand in order to shoot Tammy. It, it's just a bit confusing because like somebody I believe was an eyewitness and said somebody that was very matching to Alex's description was driving the car. You can't really prosecute a dead man. So people have kind of left it as is. It's important to understand that it's probably, it was probably Alex that did these drive-by tests. Important to note that these were probably carried out by Alex. So there is like theories around the fact that maybe Alex was the person who actually did the killings on the children and Lori and Chad were there or assisted. A little up in the air. One, Alex is dead. And two, Lori and Chad do not say anything. They haven't said anything. They still haven't said anything. January 25th of 2020, the police serve Lori, requiring her to produce her children by January 30th, five days later. February 20th rolls around. Lori fails to comply to produce her children to the police, and then she is arrested in Hawaii with two charges of child abandonment and desertion, and is later extradited to Idaho. She is additionally charged with resisting officers, criminal solicitation to commit a crime, contempt in court. She's also held on a $5 million bond because people don't really take children missing very lightly. Despite the arrest, Lori and Chad refuse to state where the children are. Not weird at all. June 9th comes around. The FBI gets involved. The Rexburg police, the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, they arrive at Chad's home in his property. Important to note that he kind of had a bit of land around. So they use the location data to find that Alex was at this location during both kind of the last days of seeing either children, right? So they begin to dig in these locations of the property and they uncover human remains. It's also important to understand that one of the main reasons they decided to do this was also because of Chad Chad's text to Tammy about the raccoon that he had shot. This is where it's going to get kind of dark because we're talking about dead children. So if that's something you don't really want to listen to, I'm going to have Ether put a timestamp beyond the descriptors of the children's graves um, and we'll get into it now. Okay.
So JJ was found buried under a tree with two black plastic bags wrapped around him. And those plastic bags were wrapped in duct tape. His grave was under several large rocks and those rocks had a bunch of wood planks under it. The FBI special agent, Steve Daniels on the site, testified that somebody took the most effort to bury these. They called JJ's burial site precise, implying the planned nature of this, right? About 50 yards away, Ty Lee was buried in the pet cemetery of the property. Prosecutor states that they believe that she was buried in the same location that Chad referred to his wife as the pet cemetery that he buried the raccoon in nine months earlier. The same special agent testifies that this burial site is a big contrast as to JJ's. Tylee's burial site was melted and charred. Really fucking disgusting. One of the Rexburg detectives testifies that his experience in these findings of remains that the investigators on hand were digging in the dirt and they had begun to smell these decomposing bodies. They had started to to uncover bits and pieces, they assumed that Tylee had been burned. There were pieces of bone, charred flesh, disgusting shit. Like, I can't believe somebody even does this or would do this to a person, let alone their own children. Investigators found additional pieces in a green bucket on the property. I don't understand the logic. I don't. The forensic pathologist says in the trial that the cause of death of the children were found to be asphyxia for JJ due to the plastic bag and duct tape over their mouth. And Ty Lee was classified as a homicide by unspecified means, basically saying that the murder was so brutal that it is not, he's not capable of pinpointing exactly how the death actually occurred. I, it's fucked up. I mean, how else can I say it, right? Like, uh, like Christ, dude. Also important to note that the investigators dug up this pet cemetery, found zero raccoon remains, right? But also there was a second pet cemetery that they just didn't search because they had found the two bodies. They were done, right? Obviously, after this all happens, Chad Daybell gets arrested. The remains are confirmed by authorities to be JJ and Ty Lee. A memorial is built along Chad's fence, which I'm sure he doesn't own anymore. That guy's arrested as shit. Um, May 2021 comes around. Chad and Lori are both charged with first degree murder for deaths of JJ and Ty Lee. Chad is also charged with the murder of his wife, Tammy. And the indictment states that both Lori and Chad did endorse and teach religious beliefs for the purpose of justifying the murders of J.J. Tylee and Tammy Daybell. According to the indictment, Chad and Lori exchanged texts about Tammy being in limbo and being possessed by a spirit named Viola. So June 2021 comes, Chad pleads not guilty to all charges, because why not? You only found two dead children in your property. In August, the prosecutors state that they will seek the death penalty against Chad. Um, he's jailed and is actually still awaiting trial. Um, it's important to note that Chad and Lori have a separate trial. It's important that they usually do this for, you know, a double offender of a crime. Um, that way, both people get a, get a fair trial and that uh, both people get punished properly if found guilty, so... Also in June of 2021, Lori is additionally charged with conspiring to murder Charles Vallow. And later in the month, the judge rules Lori incompetent to stand trial while she receives mental health treatments. During this time, she has yet to enter a plea and her case becomes stagnant. To, to add context to this, if the judge proceeding a trial views a suspect as incompetent, it means that they don't have the ability to understand the trial and what's happening. So they're not able to grasp the crime. They're not able to grasp the prosecution or their ability to defend, stuff like that. So they can't partake in their own trial, which is a uh, violation of rights, essentially. September of 2021 comes around. Chad and Tammy's children speak publicly together, and they state that they believe that their father is innocent. The daughter says she believes that Alex and Lori framed Chad for the murders. April 11th of 2022, Judge Stephen Boyce rules Lori as now mentally competent to stand trial. No details were given regarding what what she received for treatment or what she was medically diagnosed as or what she had suffered from basically just says that she's competent and able to stand trial. So let's get it done. April 19th, Lori refuses to enter a plea deal. Still, the judge enters a not guilty plea on her behalf. So she just doesn't say anything, which you will find is a reoccurring theme during her trial. Actually, May 4th rolls around and Lori is qualified for capital punishment because they basically quote that the murders were exceptionally gruesome and that she carried them out for not only these like twisted purposes, but financial gain. September 23rd, the judge bans cameras from the courtroom.
courtroom, stating that he fears the images could prevent a fair trial. The Idaho judge says the news organizations will no longer be able to shoot still photography or videos in the courtroom. Something that does actually affect trials is media. An, an easy example of this is OJ Simpson. There are reasons like jurors are like absolutely held away. Like they are put in a hotel, they get no TV, they get no internet, they get nothing. Like they have zero ability to access people, to access the information about people's opinion on the trial. Like it's intense. Even a small thing about the trial or someone's opinion on the trial heard by a juror can swing things. And this was part of the problem with OJ's trial was that the media got such big coverage of it and the jurors began getting like leakage and they began learning things and, and being swayed in a lot of ways because of the media. It's just a really good example of why this is such a, a careful procedure um, because the jurors can be as unbiased as they want. People can't be unbiased. It's really hard for humans to not be. January 7th of 2023, the judge denies the request by Lori's attorneys that her and Chad be allowed to meet and discuss strategies in person. Attorneys for Lori and Chad request several times during the same motion hearing that the trial be delayed until 2024. Lori actually does have her trial already and Chad is having his trial next year. You'll see this a lot where they'll separate these things and they'll also do this where they won't let them communicate because especially if you're trying people separately, they cannot know what the other is doing because then they'll start to share things. They'll find strategies that work and they'll they'll try to help each other out. It's, a, it's an important move by the Idaho judge. Uh, March comes around. The judge grants a motion by Chad's attorney to sever the trials. This is where that separation occurs. The trial that starts on April 3rd is Lori's, not Chad's. The judge also agrees to take the death penalty option away on March 21st from Lori. They stated that they will not have time to fully review the large amount of evidence that was turned over in the recent weeks because a lot gets turned over within these last two years. Uh, the judge notes that Lori has not waived her right to a speedy trial, so the proceedings could not be rescheduled and that she could not give her team more time to review the evidence. The death penalty is still an option for Chad Daybell as of right now. April 3rd of 2023, Lori's trial begins. Let's go over some of the highlights of the trial. The Idaho prosecutor, Lindsay Blake, said that Lori used money, power, and sex or the promise of those things to get what she wanted. The defendant will remove any obstacle in her way to get what she wants, and she wanted Chad Debo. During the trial, Lori's sister, Summer Shiflet, testifies that she trusted Lori. She didn't know where these children were in 2020 and that she's like sick to her stomach. There is a phone exchange between Summer and Lori while Lori is in jail. There's a, a huge transcript here. I'll read a bit of it. Hi, Summer. How are you? Summer, who is clearly upset, is saying, not good. How are you? Lori says, not good. Summer says, I don't know what to say. I'm willing to listen if you want to talk to me. I just don't know what to say. Lori says, I don't know what anybody knows. I've been in isolation for two weeks. I haven't talked to anyone. They know that they found JJ and Tylee buried in Chad's backyard, and we don't understand what happened. Did you know they were there? Lori says, I can't talk about it. Summer says, I don't know what to say, Lori. I mean, I love you and Alex, but this is I am sick to my stomach. Later in the conversation, she says, is there another explanation? Because I'm willing to hear it. Lori says, I can't talk about it at all, but absolutely. Summer says that she can't understand how you can throw away these children like garbage. I can't believe you were in Hawaii dancing on the beach while your kids were in the ground. I mean, you had to have known they were there. Lori says, this is your opinion. That's her response to this. Summer says, they were just little kids. I don't understand. We would have taken them for you. You cut me and mom off for four months. Lori says you don't understand can't talk about them it's a bit of a weird conversation it, it goes a lot like that summer's just trying to get any information and Lori's basically like giving these non-answers or basically being like i can't discuss that like i alluded to earlier during this trial is when the prosecution does reveal tammy's second autopsy that they exhumed for the trial and where they explain that her cause of death is asphyxia not a natural heart attack as believed previously the medical examiner testifies that he found bruises on her arms and chests consistent with someone being restrained and consistent with asphyxia as the cause of death. This is a huge bombshell in the in the court. They kind of stoked this until in the middle of the trial, which is a really good move by the prosecution to kind of be like, they've done it before. Look at this random mysterious death that's really not that mysterious because we had an actual person look this up. A forensics expert testifies during a, the prosecution's argument that there was a hair attached to JJ's body 
and that DNA is connected to Lori Vallow. This is extremely damning because if you guys don't know, and they're actually quoted saying this, the probability of randomly selecting a random individual in relation to that profile of DNA is one in 71 billion. DNA is very precise. So the fact that they found hair and it matches with Lori is extremely damning, extremely. That is a huge piece of physical evidence. It places her at the crime scene at the time of death. It implies her involvement with JJ's murder minimum. I mean, it's kind of over. We're going to be here for two more hours if I talk about this trial. There is so many weird moments. These are like huge highlights. There's a whole thing about, I believe, Colby going on stands, who's the only surviving child of Lori's left, basically chastising his mother. It doesn't really add much other than this is fucked. The number one most baffling thing about this is that the defense didn't do anything. Lori just like rested her case. Nothing. They didn't refute any of the evidence. They didn't argue any of the evidence. They didn't cross-examine any of it. Lori did not go on the stand. They didn't like refute what the prosecution argued. The team literally said that they don't believe the state has proven its case. They didn't even try. Like they didn't even attempt to go after anybody. They didn't try to like discredit anybody. They didn't try to like argue the claims that like damn Lori Moore, like nothing. It's baffling. It's a crazy move by the defense in some such a damning and important trial, you will be absolutely shocked to hear Lori was found guilty on all charges. So yeah, just a just a whole piece of shit all the way around. It's it's not surprising. You, you won't be shocked that she is now serving life in prison without parole. She did not receive the death penalty. Uh, once again, the judge did waive that. That is still something that can be brought back up. That is a whole separate case and, and thing that they have to do. Like I said earlier, Chad Daybell has not stand trial yet. Apparently, He's fit to stand trial April 1st of next year. That's about it for this one. Brutal first one to go into, but I hope you guys enjoy this. Obviously, if you hear about any important cases or any interesting subjects, or you want me to talk about any interesting subjects, please let me know. Please subscribe. But that's about it for me. We will see you during the next crime time. Peace.